Hey everyone, Rob from Southgate Media Group here. Before we get started with this podcast, we have a quick message. If this is your first time checking out the show, we love that you found us and we really hope you enjoy it. What we have to say is for the subscribers. If you enjoy our shows, would you please donate to help keep these going? We don't want to have to put traditional ads on these shows, but this does cost money. So we really do rely heavily on donations. To make a donation to the show, please go to our website, www.southgatemediagroup.com. Go to the page for the show, and in the upper right-hand corner is a donate button. It takes you right to PayPal, and you can donate whatever amount you want. Thanks a lot for listening, everybody. And now, on with the show. night you know what that means another episode of biters is being recorded <laughs> oh it's a it's a nighttime one guys so bear with us <laughs> we had a, i'm already misfiring and uh <laughs> and all sorts of problems we've already had a couple misfires as uh, starting this off uh i've got it's a new right. headset new microphone so <laughs> this can't you know it's I'm, I'm breaking it in for the first time so uh basically a lot of things can pro- probably go wrong with this one so <laughs> Um, anyway, uh, we're back, and if you're new to the show, uh, I'm Jeff Marsick, uh, and with me is my co-host, Kirk Manley. What's up? And, uh, yeah, we, you're here to listen to us yap about uh, The Walking Dead, this, uh, this week's episode, the 10th episode of Season 5, called Them. It's um, like it's like a cool like a uh, monster movie title. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, you know, it wasn't there, in fact, wasn't there a great, like, 1950s monster movie about giant ants, radioactive giant ants, and it was called Them. You might be right. I I've I think gotta... something like that. Yeah, that was a favorite when I was a kid. So that's like you know horse and buggy era. I, I didn't even have TVs back then, did they? No, no. We went we went and saw plays. <laughs> Everything was theater in the round. You're right. 1954. <laughs> Woo! The earliest atomic tests in New Mexico caused common ants to mutate into <laughs> giant man-eating monsters that threaten civilization. Dude, you have like Google superpowers. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, you know what it is? It's all that flash podcasting you're uh, yeah, doing. Yeah. You're like, <laughs> 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 well done, well done. See, I, I got a few brain cells still clicking up there. All right. Well, before right, we get, give us some numbers. All what, right, so the numbers. Happened? Well, the numbers this week are interesting because so last week we um, uh, Walking Dead didn't do uh, well. They did fifteen point eight, but they were kind uh, fifteen point eight million uh, overall. But they were kind of challenged because the Grammys were on. Well, this week had Saturday Night Live's fortieth anniversary yeah. special. Yeah, everybody which, in this house watched that. Well, I've DVR'd it, and my wife are gonna, and I are going to watch it. We've heard nothing but good things about it. So, um, I, so. But so it, it's it, it's kind of tricky. So it's actually uh, the viewership is down for Walking Dead, down 22 percent week over week. They only pulled in 7.9 million viewers in the 18 to 49 group, uh, while the Saturday Night Live had uh, yeah. almost 11 million. Yeah. Um, and same so, audience. So overall for the Walking Dead, there were 12.3 million overall versus 15.8 last week. But Saturday Night Live had like twice that, 24 and a half. However, the, the, the metrics are kind of skewed these days because everybody DVRs things. So what they found was, yes, last week Walking Dead suffered against the Grammys. But then when you factor in what they call uh, live plus three, so it's the three days lag after you know, people DVR'd it all of a sudden Walking Dead gets a 30% boost in ratings. Right. So it, it's probably going to happen again here. People were DVRing uh, the, the right. Walking Dead so that they could watch the Saturday Night Live right. thing. Makes sense. Now, you may not know the answer to this, I don't know, but how do they measure the DVR? I've heard those numbers thrown around before. I, I have no idea how they measure that. I mean, Nielsen, 
they used in the I don't know if it still does, but my understanding was that they Nielsen would actually make you know give you a box, a box right? So that whenever you turned on your TV, whatever channels you went to, that Nielsen thing reported that back to them. How do they know who's what I'm DVRing? Is that through the cable companies and stuff? I'm not sure how it is that they're that that they're doing it, but I know that it's still a bit of a challenge. So it's still slushy. The numbers aren't yeah uh, you know exact. I um, bet that I bet it's back, backed out of the num like the DVR sends you know the DVR is directly linked digitally to to the cable company, so they probably can get those numbers from the cable company. You know what I mean? Yeah, you'd think that this day and age that we can just they can get yeah. the information pretty quick. But it'll be interesting because so last week was the Grammys. This week was that special Saturday Night Live event. Uh, this week coming up is the Oscars. Uh, oh, jeez. So last year, just to put it in context, last year The Walking Dead had 12, $12.6 million in that coveted 18 to 49 group. Uh, but there were 43, almost $44 million that were watching the Oscars. So again, it's probably going to be, uh, you know, The Walking Dead is probably going to have 12 million, 11, 12 million viewers, but then they're DVRing it so they can watch the Oscars and you yeah. know, they'll, they'll make up I for wonder, it. I wonder if it'll do as much damage as, I, I don't, it would seem that the audiences would be a little bit different for the Academy Awards than for the 40th well, I was, anniversary well, I was, of Saturday Night Live. That I would think it'd be younger for the Saturday Night Live audience, which is more skewed towards the Walking Dead audience. Whereas the Academy Awards, I would think, would be more of an older well, I audience. Would too. I don't know. That's just well, my I would inst- too. But I would. But I, looking at the numbers, they said that the 18 to 49 group for Walking Dead for the Oscars, there were 40, 43 million were watching the Oscars. You know, so it's, um, it's, it's pretty big, but, uh, um, but then I had sent, uh, I'd sent Kirk this article today from, I can't remember where I got it from. Oh, I think it was in New York post or whatever, but they were talking about, uh, how, uh, the number of people that are watching who aren't watching TV anymore right. is staggering. Right. How many are people are just, they're, they're streaming it. And Netflix, Hulu, Amazon, their iTunes, yeah, yeah. and it's yeah. and I was telling Kirk how, jeez, uh, almost five years ago now, when I was working in finance, and the uh, the 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 term cord cutters started coming out, and people, right. were, you know, that movement, that fringe movement, started to come out. And I remember reading a po- report out of uh, like Cablevision uh, uh, or Comcast, one of them. And they said that, yeah, you know, we're starting to see this, this, this cord cutting movement, but it's, it's kind of like in the frontier fringe territories of like Utah or Montana. And it's not going to be a thing. We don't, we don't have to, that's that forget about it. And as soon as I heard that, as soon as I like heard what it was about, I was like, Oh my God, are you kidding me? Absolutely. (laughs) If I could cut the cord, you know, I, I totally would. And now here we are five years later and suddenly it's, Oh, wait a minute. Um, that cord cutting thing, it's not a thing. It's a capital T H I N G. It's actually a thing now. <laughs> we should be concerned about that. Well, and I think that you know the social changes, the behavioral. Because that article kept referring to the you know behaviors of viewing behaviors and stuff like that. And those always changed a little slower. But um, those behaviors that are directly linked to technology, which changes so quickly. Oh yeah. Is going to affect that those social and behavioral changes uh, really quickly as well. So I'm not I'm not surprised you you, you foresaw that coming. Um, yeah, I have as I was mentioned in the, my email response to you. I've got family actually who live out in L.A. and they have um, they have no television other than iTunes and Netflix on internet and stuff like that. They don't have any cable or any, you know, regular street. They're like, you know, don't tweet your pictures to me about right. <laughs> about the episode, you know, <laughs> your tribute. Cause uh, I, I don't until Monday, you know, so cause uh, I don't get into iTunes until Monday. So yeah, so it's definitely, it's happening. You know, I, just think of, I, just, I just think of all the expendable, the, the more expendable cash I would have if I wasn't putting out a, you know, a monthly nut to the cable company. Yeah, yeah. Well, they were they were talking about the eighty mil. Is it eighty million or was yeah. it eighty billion? Eighty million. Eighty million in advertising that uh, is really up for grabs. You yeah. know, as that starts to change. You know, so it's going to be an interesting time. But uh, you know, I have to say, uh, one of the most excited things I'm, I'm one of the most um, one of the things I'm most excited and looking forward to is the Daredevil series. Oh yeah. And a big part of that is because of the fact that it's going to come out 
in bulk and you're going to be able to binge watch it. You know, it's, I mean, that's definitely a big, huge drawing thing, you know, and I, I'm, uh, uh, and the fact, and the way they're doing it too, if you, with the, I know we're kind of switching gears here off of Walking Dead, so my apologies to our to Biter's listeners who, who aren't interested in this stuff, but, um, you, you know, they're going to have the different, the different characters they're doing. They're doing the Daredevil, then they're doing what power, um, Luke Cage, and they're going to do, um, uh, his wife there, the Jessica, um, Jessica Drew, Jessica, jo- Jessica Jones, Jessica right? Jones, right? Yeah. Jessica Jones, and then uh, is it Iron Fist is going to be the fourth? Yeah. And then they're going to bring then the, the fifth is going to be them together as a team, the Defenders. Yeah. So you know you're going to get a series, and then you're going to have a break like you would in a normal series now that you've gotten used to, whether it was The Sopranos or whether it's even Walking Dead, where you have these long chunks in between, you know what I mean? And then you're going to get another series that ties back, so it's almost like an ongoing series, but really Marvel Comics, you know right. what I mean? It's just, uh, it's exciting, and it could never have been done properly on, on regular broadcast television, so. Okay. All right. Tangential thought there. So, on, on that note... Um, on that note... So I just want to read a, a thing that we got from Gary Dabrowski, who uh, he said, great show, guys. I listened to four, including yours, Walking Dead podcasts, and this is my favorite hands down. There are two that are okay. Woo! Yeah. There are two that are okay <laughs> and another that is way too fanboyish most of the time. Biters is not afraid to give an episode of Walking Dead a lower rating when it deserves it, while others will give a higher rating than they deserve. So right. I like that, being able to uh, yeah. call a spade a spade when it needs to be. Yeah. Well, I think we try, you know, we try to be fair. I mean, I think, you know, I've always felt that if you don't love the show, then why the hell do a podcast about it? You're right. You know what I mean, <laughs> it's like, you know, I listened, to, I'm not going to name any names, but there's, I, I listened to one podcast out there and, and it just, I couldn't even finish it because all, it was just the two of them talking about all the problems and, and, and the, the mistakes the writers were making and how horrible this was and how horrible that was and how they really messed up on that. And, and I'm just like, dude, why, why bother doing a podcast about it? You know what I mean? But at the same time, you know, there, you, you, you gotta be, uh, you gotta be a little bit honest about what, um, what may have been a missed opportunity or not handled as well as uh, it, it could have been. I mean, certainly we all, you know, know season two was not the best season of <laughs> the walking right. dead. There's lots of problems, you know, but uh, anyway, so thanks Gary. That was, that was some nice comments. We appreciate that. All right. And then, uh, okay. So I also want to, this is about last week's episode. Diane uh, Maythorn wrote in, and she had a couple things. One was, uh, she said, okay, another thing that I think might be an Easter egg homage in uh, 5.9, there's a reference to paying, quote, the high cost of living. I'm sure you guys are Neil Gaiman fans. Remember the graphic novel, Death, the High Cost of Living, one of my favorites. I thought that was interesting. Yeah, I thought it was great. I think she posted that on, on uh, the Facebook page too, and I commented, you know, I, I think that... Um, my my understanding is is that uh, Scott Gimple is a big comic book fan as you know as well as obviously a um, fan of lots of different stuff. But I understand he's also a big fan of comics, so I wasn't surprised to uh, to hear that he may have you know that may have been a tip of the hat to uh, to that series. And then she also wrote, uh, next time she wrote, she said, Jeff, I can see you rolling your eyes already. I bought ex- Expired Love, and I love it. The last song is a song that Beth plays for Daryl in the funeral home. Yes, I am a pathetic fangirl. <laughs> um, yes, Diane, I, I did roll my eyes. So <laughs> I won't lie to you. I have to say, I really liked that song in last week's episode. I thought that was the best musical contribution of the characters to, to date. I didn't care for the one in the funeral home. I didn't, um, I didn't, lots of people got all gooey eyed about, you know, when she was singing around the campfire in season three or two or whatever it was. And I right. didn't do anything. For her. But the song at the end here, and I think because I really just, I liked the sound of it. I liked the, the tenor of it, but also the, the words just so perfectly tied into the story. You know, I liked that. All right, so I think that that covers it for comments that uh, we had that didn't pertain to this episode. Um, so we do have some from people um, that are their feedback and comments on the episode. So we'll we'll come back to those at the end after we've done our our review. Uh, something I missed last week was um, the live tweets of the week. 
Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> we got to get a sound effect, you know, some sort of like <laughs> bird tweeting and then like getting shot or something. <laughs> and um, so uh, let's see. We had some funny ones. Uh, let's see. Um, at Celt- Celtic So, which is our friend Thomas, um, Zombie NATO. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, he also, uh, in reference to, uh, into, um, Daryl's worm uh, meal there, but they were goo goo worms. <laughs> Reference back to uh, to the uh, goo goo cookies yeah. or the goo goo whatever. Goo clusters. Goo goo clusters. Thank you. At Kevin Tien, I'd listen if Michonne told me to stop. <laughs> Dude, yeah. Did you see the look on right? her face? I, I know. Was... Like, like, really, seriously. That's Sasha some... and Michonne. That takes my money's some serious on, balls. My money's on Michonne. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, at too short 35 watching this episode is seriously making me feel guilty about drinking my Poland spring <laughs> <laughs> uh, at Justin Thomas 97 this episode needs more Eugene <laughs> oh, <my laughs> and all I could think of when I read that was this episode needs more cowbell <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's because I just watched that 40th anniversary uh, SNL uh, at Father Gabriel WD, there's something just magical about Daryl crying. It's like seeing a unicorn or finding Atlantis. <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty good. And the hashtag Real Men Cry. Uh, then there was a couple about the dogs. Uh, at Hoodie 3, sometimes you must P A W S pause for a good meal. <laughs> Boo. So, all right. Boo. Uh, at the rules, all dogs do not go to heaven. <laughs> that was cute. Uh, at O Rodriguez three uh, said, um, "Hot dogs, anyone?" And boo. then uh, yeah, boo, another bad one. Then there was a couple for Sasha at Terrence underscore Sage. My name is Sasha. See me stab and shoot. <laughs> I like that one. But here's my favorite, Sasha. At H K P H A N A at H K Fan. Sasha will cut a bitch. <laughs> Hashtag sorry, Abe. <laughs> yeah. That was great. And then there were two about Aaron. Uh, at Brandon Breaks. Aaron's good news. He can magically fix music boxes. <laughs> that was kind of cute. And then uh, the final one here is at TV Tag, TWD. No offense, buddy, but the last guy who said that tried to eat us. Buzz off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thought that was cute. Could they have made Aaron look any like more like uh, off the LL Bean catalog or what? Uh, seriously, it was like yeah, he just we, we, he definitely we got, had a shower and a shave this more that morning. Oh my lord! Our, everybody in our in our little you know our little group is uh, looking haggard and rough, and the clothes are tattered, and <laughs> and uh, you know I, I, you can wring Daryl's hair out for motor oil these days, and meanwhile this Aaron sh- shows up and he's just. Yeah, what Walmart did he just step out of? I know it, it almost it almost looked like it was like somebody from the crew had mistakenly walked yeah. into the shot and they Dude, had during the shot <laughs> and, and right and nobody caught it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, so we got uh, them. them. What do you think? What do you think that means? So this was uh, this was this was written by Heather Belson, who uh, she also wrote Self Help. Um, she's actually a producer on the show. She so she wrote this. She wrote Self Help. Um, and she's written, uh, uh, she did a Black Sails episode as well. Um, and it was directed by Julius Ramsey, who, he's normally an editor for this show, but he, uh, um, uh, he edited Consumed, Four Walls and a Roof, and uh, No no Sanctuary, so, uh, with some other shows as well. So, um, the, uh, you know, this was this was for me. This was just an episode that kind of um, we had to clear some we had to clear some dead air, or we had to clear some. Uh, 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 you know, we went from Beth emotional dying, baggage. Yeah, we went from Beth dying to Tyrese dying, and there wasn't any chance for every anybody to uh, come to terms with any yeah. of that. So yeah. we needed an episode that kind of just you know allowed allowed some of that catch up to happen. So. Uh, you know, for me, it wasn't, um, you know, it wasn't a fantastic episode. Um, it was, there, there were good parts to it. Um, I, for me, it was, it was basically, uh, I, I gave it, I gave it a three. Oh my gosh. Okay. I gave it four. 
Um, I, I thought it was uh, I thought it was really strong. I thought it was great to get a super quiet episode. Um, you know, I think that the, the Walking Dead is best when it's quiet. <laughs> Yeah. You know what I mean? And uh, not as we've talked about many times before. Um, I liked the chance to get the character development, to get to see some of these characters deal with some of these issues, like you're saying. Um, to me, without episodes like granted, didn't have the action, um, didn't have the pace, didn't have, you know, um, wasn't as thrilling, you know, um, there wasn't any impending threat. <clears throat> All of those things that, you know, you kind of your adrenaline you're just looking for in a, in a Walking Dead episode. But at the same time, if we don't have episodes like this, I feel like we don't get a chance to develop the characters and then become invested in them, care about them, and then have those more powerful episodes be even more powerful. Right. Um, so, yeah, so, you can't go, you can't have every episode can't be an adrenaline fueled romp. You got to have the, right. you know, the, the pause that refreshes. So I gave it uh, four headshots. Um, and I think that the title is pretty self-evident. You know, I think it's, you know, the, the whole thing, the whole episode seemed to be about how they were becoming the walking dead, um, and living in this environment. Um, just like, you know, Rick talks about, which I'm sure we'll get to, but more specifically that there were really kind of two kinds of walking dead. There's, there's Daryl, Sasha and Maggie, which are kind of the emotionally dead. And then there's, you know, all the rest of them, which are physically dead. Mm-hmm. And I kind of saw those as two almost separate stories going on simultaneously. Um, so, but I, I, I enjoyed it. So, uh, so I'll start off with, with, with the good. Um, I mean, there was, again, it's the visuals and how it was shot were, uh, was, was really, was, was great. Um, I liked how that one, the shot of them walking in a line, our yeah. group walking in a line in front, and then you look behind them about 30 yards, and there's the walking dead behind. And you really couldn't tell. The way they were both just kind of shambling along, you couldn't tell the two apart, you know. And it was, Absolutely. And, and it was great that, uh, you, you know, you, you didn't – and it was great that it was silent, that they were just – that there wasn't talking. There wasn't dialogue going on there. You had, uh, you had uh, Gabriel, uh, uh, you know – coming you know coming up and trying to talk to maggie and and she just shutting him down and i love the fact that she that she looked at him and she was like you were supposed to tend to your flock right and yeah. you didn't <laughs> don't think we've forgotten about that you know yeah. just yeah uh don't try to pretend that didn't happen yeah and, yeah. and and there wasn't the uh, you know and there were there were I thought there were really good moments uh, the the Carol and Daryl moment I really liked um, yep. where uh, and I was it, it was one of those scenes where I was like I was like don't don't start crying now don't start crying now because you, you knew that you, you knew that Daryl had to, at some point he had to. He, there had to be a break in the in his facade a little bit. He had to he had to get that emotion out, right? And and I and I was at that scene with Carol. I was like, don't let it happen here. Don't let it happen here. And it didn't. And it was. And I thought that was a, a great scene. And again, how we've talked about in the past about uh, is there a relationship between the two of them? And no, it's more like a you know, it's not a it's not a physical relationship. It's not a you know kind of. A, a, loving you know love relationship but it's a more of a not even not even a a, a mother son there's just there's just a you know it's family yeah to, to me it struck as family you know, and, the, and that it's... and yeah and that and that scene right there you know she kisses him on the forehead and just well, she brushes her his hair away from his head as you would you know like a you know a sibling or a or a or, you know or a son or whatever but yeah you know i think i agree i totally agree uh, Plus, there's also there was also since you brought that scene up, where she gives the Beth's knife to him, mm-hmm. and there were a few little subtle because the show obviously is walking a very close tightrope. They don't want to pick a side. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they don't, you know, they don't want to commit to a side because the you know the whole Beth Daryl Carol Daryl battle. You know what I mean? They like that that that's good for business as far as the show is concerned. Right. You know what I mean? So I understand they don't they don't want to jump the, on on one of those bandwagons. But to me, the conversation with Rick and him as they're walking and he's hold, Rick's holding Judith, and he's saying to him, you know, I know you lost something back in Atlanta. You know, in other words, Rick's trying to reach out to him, mm-hmm. trying to get him to open up, trying to, to support him. But he's also recognizing that there was some something important there, 
you know, something emotionally important there that was lost. Um, pretty funny that you know, Carol's response is, Judith is hungry. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, and then Carol giving the, the, the knife to him is, you know, and saying to him, she saved me, she saved you too, I think. And, you know, there's, there's a, there was a little bit of a recognition that Beth was something more than just a friend. Right. You know, in a romantic way, that that was heading that way for him. He was having feelings for her and emotions for her. Whereas with with this scene with Carol, it's kind of clear that he has a special bond with her, but it's different. Right. I, I totally agree with you. Um, now, a couple other things that were that I I liked were uh, the conversation um, about uh, when uh, when Maggie says how much longer. I think it was Maggie who said it when she said how much longer we got. And right. Who'd she say it to? Was that that was Michelle? Sasha. Was talking, or was that Sasha? She and Sasha come up onto the road, and, and oh right, right. She's saying they haven't got anything either, and then she's like, "Well, how much longer?" And then Sasha says, "Oh, eight sixty, 60 miles." miles. And, and like, then and then Maggie says, "I wasn't talking about that," which I thought right. was you know I thought was great. Um, yeah. And uh, it, it just I I like the fact that they're uh, Maggie talking to uh, to. Uh, Gabriel that, um, uh, you know, she says, yeah, she used to believe in, she used to believe in God once upon a time. And, and he's clearly kind of lost his connection to, to God. And there was, there was just that feeling that, that hopelessness that was just, and, and, and every actor just carried it so well. I mean, everybody just looked like they had a thousand pounds dragging off of them, you know? And so there's this, it's like hopelessness and just this weight on them. And at the end, or yeah, towards the end with the, uh, the big storm that, that comes up. And I know that it, that storm has gotten, like you said, the zombie NATO, um, which actually should be a sci-fi movie, you know, uh, if you think about it, they, my son, my son is addicted to the shark NATO movies. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I actually liked it, or I was going to say is that I, I've seen some of the places on the internet about how, oh, that was super cheesy and yeah, that thing yeah. touched down and it didn't destroy the barn. I actually like that. Um, yeah. And we've seen instances of, of things like that uh, all, all over the place of, you know, quote unquote acts of God where. Oh, yeah, things absolutely. Get, and I so I really I really like that because if I was coming out, if I was one of them and I was coming out of that that barn my my faith or the the uh the little um you know the the little needle on my gas tank of hope would tick up a little bit because there's you know all that destruction came through and didn't touch the barn so so i i like that with without that without something like that what the hell else do you have you know i mean you've you've gotten you've got nothing you've you've burned through you know two two rays of light that you had in your group and you've gone this struggle with no water good lord i mean up until that storm came up it, it looked like you know that was the end of them there there's no water right. you know so yeah no i i mean i think that was a great i didn't even have that down as a no but i think that was a great you know i i mentioned a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about the fact that They've never introduced weather as a as a factor, right. you know what I mean? And they finally did. And I think it, it and not only that, but the idea of dehydration and the de and not getting water and starvation. I mean, that is a real, real threat. Uh, I mean, you can't go more than a couple of days without water. Right. I mean, that's a real threat that that as opposed to the you know the human threat that's always around and the zombie threat that's always around. They have this added component, and they finally brought that to the table in this episode. And I thought that was great. The uh, when they're walking along and they're being followed by the, the the not not so much a horde but the group of zombies behind them and Rick had made the comment that they're basically down to their they, they've got no energy they're down to their right. their last rounds and so when they make that little stand at the at the bridge and then basically just let the zombies just you know fall off the you know fall off the the bridge I thought that was again. We're seeing we're seeing some intelligence here. Why expend yeah. the energy? Just yeah. let them do their thing, and then Sasha kind of goes off. Well, the, the other thing, that, but absolutely, she goes off the reservation, and it makes it even more powerful because there, those that are still rational, those who are still trying to survive, those who have not given up, are using their brain and saying, "Okay, we have to recognize the reality that we're at our weakest." 
and that to just go in like a normal, you know, one on, you know, toe to toe battle with them is a total mistake. Mm -hmm. So we have to be, we have to think up something, you know, in, creative to to deal with this problem. And she just completely goes off the reservation, like you said. And I think that that, you know, that that uh, was another great ref way to demonstrate that she's not thinking, she's not using her head. You know, she's detached a little bit. Um, I also, since you brought that scene up, I, I loved how Rick almost falls himself. I don't yeah. know if you noticed. Yeah. I don't know if that was an accident or, or done on purpose, but that was it was cool because it didn't look very treacherous. You know, right. like the it when the, the ravine didn't look too deep. There wasn't water running. It didn't look. But then when he starts to stumble, it was kind of like whoa. You know, maybe this is kind of a treacherous little uh, slip, slope right there. Michonne's step to the side. Freaking awesome! Yeah, uh, right. She just steps to the side. The zombie goes flying. I was like, that is that is awesome. Um, and then how about <laughs> Abraham when she goes charging in? Abraham goes, plan just got dicked. Yeah, <laughs> I was laughing out loud on that one. Uh, and then Daryl with the last minute save. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Rick, yeah. How many times has Daryl saved Rick now? I mean, it's like it's crazy. So that was awesome. So it was a great a great scene. Um. I, I, it, it's funny because when we talk about the bad, this scene is going to come up again, but the scene in the barn when Daryl looks through and the storm is, is raging and you just see, first of all, it was, I mean, just terrifically shot looking yes. through the slats in the, you know, yep. between the two doors and you see through the flashes of lightning, you just see all these zombies coming at you. And then, yep. uh, you know, the, just everybody getting together to keep the doors, to, to keep the doors shut against the, you've got all of this wind and storm howling around you. You've got these things on the other side that are trying to get through and eat you. And, you know, I love the shot of their, you know, their boots digging into the dirt and just really trying to hold yeah. the door closed and, and, you know, again, it was one of those where the, as the episode in the beginning of the episode, everybody was kind of fractured. You had, you had team Abraham kind of off on their side. You had Maggie. She was kind of distant. You had Gabriel who's no one wants to align with him. Um, you've got, uh, uh, you know, Sasha, she's, you know, she's carrying baggage on her. Daryl disappears on a whim whenever he wants. And, and right. you just had everybody was just fractured. And they were just they were just a group of people together. Um, but then they all came together and became that family, you yep. know, to to keep them all alive. So the, you went full circle with this with this episode. Oh, absolutely! I have a lot to say about the barn sequence, but it's it's all in my um, ugly section. So I'm going to hold off on responding too much. But I totally agree with you. So I think that's pretty much, uh, those are pretty much all my goods. What do you got? Um, I got a ton, but please jump in as I go here. Um, I wanted to come back to, you had mentioned camera angles. There were a couple other really cool shots I liked. Um, when they get, when the van runs out of gas and they, and they, you hear the voiceover says, so we walk. And then the camera is down on the ground yeah. and the doors were opening and you're seeing the boots hit the ground. And it was just ominous, this long road ahead yep. and these boots hitting the ground and you realize, wow, this is going to be, a, a, you know, this is going to be a burden, man. Um, I thought that was, that was great. Um, and then the shot with the group sitting, I think it's when they're eating the dog. I'm not positive. And then Noah is very obviously set apart. Right. They're in like a circle and he's outside the circle with his back to them. Yep. Definitely, you know, well, I mean, just a really well choreographed shot. So visually, without saying anything, this guy feels he doesn't fit in yet. He feels guilty. He feels responsible for Tyrese's death. All of this stuff is just a beautiful, beautiful way to do it. Um, uh, starting going back to the beginning, you know, that quiet opening. I love the quiet openings. Whenever they do the quiet openings, like we talked about, the fact that we start with the three amigos of depression and pain, you know, I mm -hmm. mean, it's the three of them. You kind of really start right off. This is going to be their journey through hell. You know what I mean? And, uh, boy, you couldn't... <laughs> You couldn't say it better than eating worms. Yeah. <laughs> that, was, that was powerful. Um, opening with Maggie's eyes and her lips parched. She's crying. You know, that you were talking about, you know, the, her talk, conversation with Gabriel and, and, and the spirituality and stuff and her loss of that. And I, I, I totally think that that's true. The other thing is, is when I see that shot of her eyes opening with her eyes, I think of, you know, the eyes are the windows to the soul is the expression. Mm -hmm. And we start off with a shot of her eyes. And one, she's not even looking at us. And two, she's crying. 
and rubbing her eyes. And there's definitely, you know, this person's soul is in pain. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what I got from that shot. And then of course the zombie comes up and she doesn't even care. Um, she's, you know, she's completely running on empty and, and is, is broken and dead inside to, to a degree. And I, I think they're try they're teasing us and they teased us through the whole beginning of it. I think about Maggie's suicide from the comic Oops, spoiler alert, <laughs> sorry, but, um, I think that's not going to happen. I know we've talked about that a couple of times here before. I think, I think they take stuff from the comic and they bring it into the show in different ways in different places. And I think the suicide attempt by Beth in season two, I think it was season two. Mm -hmm. I think that constitutes the suicide attempt we're going to get of a of a of a of a, um, a group member. And I think that um, you know by the end of this, I felt confirmed about that because I think you know, like you said, Maggie and Sasha and Daryl all come full circle by the end, mm -hmm. and um, you know she's she's worked that out. But certainly, when this started off, they were definitely teasing us with that. You know what I mean? Right. She's she was definitely te teasing us with that. Um, the dead frogs, you know, lots of again more religious symbolism. I thought here, uh, you know, it, did, it didn't get more. It didn't get more. Uh religiously symbolized, I don't know if that's... <laughs> Symbolic. There you go. Then, then I mean, the it looked like a Mike were... Magnola page, you know what yeah, I mean? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I thought, you know, like plague, end of times, all that kind of stuff. But I thought it was really interesting that when she sees them, she tries to bury one of them. Mm. It's almost like yeah. instinctual. She just tries to cover it up and bury it as if she's trying to bury, you know, her own her own feelings. As I think. As opposed to you know? realizing that them's good eating, and they she should probably. Yeah, right. Them. I mean, come on, it's better than worms. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see. I was going to say also about that suicide thing. I got a note here that that may also be another reason why they brought that up again in Slab Town to remind us that Beth had done that, so that kind of. We've we've been there. We've done that. You know what I mean. Um, but I don't know. Um, let's see. Uh, I won't talk much about Gabriel because you did already. Um, I, I loved that Carl gives her the the broken uh, gives Maggie the broken uh, music box, mm -hmm. and I just thought that that was very symbolic of Beth and her music. Um, you know, and that she was broken and that broke her heart, and and then of course of her own inner spirit, her own you know you know her own music inside you know was broken um so i just thought that was that was really cool and i, I love how they come back to that which i'll get to um uh and then i, I thought it was cool that too that michonne michonne's you know michonne went to her own dark spot remember in the beginning was it oh, yeah. that was season four you know and um or was it season five? No, season four. Yeah. Season four. And the first half of season four. So she really knows what she's looking at, you know? And she could see it in Tyrese when it happened with him. And she can see it now with Sasha. And I just thought that was really cool and very consistent with the character. It was mm -hmm. good writing. It was like, you know, that this person, if, you know, had it nailed with Tyrese, they would have it nailed with Sasha too. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was impressed with that from a writing point well, of view. Well, I thought it was, I thought it was, yeah. And I was kind of caught off guard. And at the same time, I, I liked that they wrote it in there. Because she was, you know, when she was talking about Tyrese and she said that, uh, you know, she basically called him, you know, she said it, it made him stupid. And right. that's pretty, that's pretty bold to, to say, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I don't think Sasha took it too well. <laughs> no, but, I, but it was true. And, oh, and, absolutely. And, it, was, it was dead on, dead on. Yeah. So that just, that, that made me respect Michonne e yeah. even more. Absolutely. Um, man, I tell you, the zombie tied up in the trunk was a, was a really wild scene. So uh, when I, I first, when I first saw that, the first thing I thought of was, because I watch a lot of you know, shows about awful people and I was like, oh my God, <laughs> there's a kidnapper or a serial killer who he put this woman in the trunk and she died. And so there's a serial killer somewhere floating around who right, might still right, be right. Um, but, uh, so what it, so what did you take? What did you take out of that scene? Well, it's hard because I had, <clears throat> I had the same thought. I mean, you know, you don't, it, your first thought is, is that this person was put in there alive, you know, because why would you gag a zombie? Exactly. You know? yeah. That's not going to stop them from talking <clears throat> or from biting. Um, so that was disturbing. But but it's not clear, you know, <clears throat> it's not clear why she's there. And, you know, is was she a victim or 
was she a loved one that somebody couldn't let go of? You know, I think it doesn't really matter because I think what was was is that they're symbol. Both of those possibilities are symbolic of Beth. I think to Maggie and and I think to some degree her her own self. You know, they at this point I think she feels like she's a victim of this horrible world that they live in. You know, that she's trapped in, she can't get out of. That you know, um, so I think that you know she closes the trunk, but then realizes you know she wants to put that down just like she wants to put it down on herself. And again, I think they're teasing the whole suicide thing. They were teasing the whole, how desperate is she? You know? And of course, then when she can't get it open and she can't do it, she it was right to the point where she's about ready to shoot with a gun, right. you know, which is only going to bring more zombies and you know, more problems. And you know, so, I mean, she was really, it, it really hit a chord with her. Well, <clears throat> well, with Maggie at the beginning of the episode, when she talks about, when she's talking about how, you know, what she says, she says, well, I thought she was dead. You know, I, I thought, I just figured that she was dead. It was almost like she was, they were writing for her, um, they were answering the questions and concerns that all yeah. of us viewers had. Well, why doesn't she care? Why hasn't she shed a tear over her sister? Why has she not thought about Beth at all during this entire, you know, while they've been walking around? Okay, now we've got the reason why. Right. And then when she gets, when she sees the, the woman in the trunk, I think then it really comes back to her like, holy crap, did Beth, is this what Beth endured? Right. You know, and. Right, exactly. Beth so, was a victim. She got kidnapped. Right. So that know? big, so that really brought the, I, I think that made Maggie feel even Th that more like crap about herself because like she just got face to face with what it could have been. Absolutely. I agree. I, I totally agree. Um, and then of course, Glenn steps in and very compassionately, um, and I, I, this will also be part of my bad, just as a little preview, <laughs> but very compassionately, you know, very supportive, you know, talks her through, tell, you know, helps her see that they, you know, tries to help her see that they have to keep fighting because she says she doesn't want to fight anymore. Um, and then after that discussion, because I think it had an effect on, on Maggie, I love that Glenn pauses on the decision to leave the trunk open. And to me, that was very kind of <clears throat> symbolic of the fact that he had just helped helped free Maggie a little bit. And um, I don't know. That's that's how I read that. Mm. You know what I mean? Kind of it was like you know this poor lady is in here. We 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 you know we were gracious enough to kill her so that she's not <laughs> not a zombie anymore. But I'm not going to shut her back inside this hole. You know what I mean? Right. You know it was just um, I know it was just it was interesting. <clears throat> Finally got my dogs. Not wolves, but dogs. Yeah. I'll take it. You know? <laughs> I mean, I really think, you know, if you've ever, not that I'm a, when you like to call me this all the time, a prepper. Isn't it prepper? Isn't it? That, isn't that what it is? Yeah. The, the whole Doomsday series. prepper. Yeah. I like to watch some, I don't watch the Doomsday prepper show, but I watched a, a series once about how, you know, the, um, how the earth would be if humans all of a sudden were gone. Did you, oh, they've ever, got did a, you see yeah, that? Yeah, they've got a, they've got a, so, someone put a book out of that oh, as well. It's freaking awesome. Yeah. And they bring all these scientists in and talk about, you know, how quickly vegetation would take oh, over yeah. things and how animal wildlife would flourish and, and come back into the areas and quickly, you know, there would be, you know, a lot of predators that are not here anymore, wolves, coyotes, things like that. And, um, they, you know, they're two years or more into the apocalypse. I have to believe there would be massive herds of deer and big herds of wolves hunting them, stuff like that going on, you know, and that they'd be running into that. Obviously, there's financial issues with trying to stage that and and uh, do that and have it work on the show. But but it was nice to see them at least, um, you know, pay a little bit of tribute to it with the with the dogs. It made me think of uh, Detroit when uh, when Detroit uh, basically you know became a no man's land and how they said that there were just packs of dogs right. uh, roaming the streets <laughs> then uh when they're when they're they're eating the dog i think and having that whole moment or whatever sasha said you know stops to talk to noah who i already pointed out they kind of threw a visual setup or through the shot setup you know kind of showed that he's isolated himself and he says i don't think i'm gonna make it and then she says you won't then you know or then you won't and then she says don't think just eat mm-hmm to me, what? Who doesn't think but just eats zombies? You know what I mean? I mean that 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 that's where she's at at that point. You know what I mean? She's just about eating and killing at this point. You know what I mean? She has no she she when those dogs showed up and she could shoot something that was alive, she was in heaven. You know what I mean? 
right? I mean, how quickly did she take them out? Oh, yeah. But everyone else was just just startled, and she's like already poom, poom, poom. You know what I mean? Yeah, but, she, the, but, uh, but the thing is, too, is that, it, it, and this is, uh, the dogs are actually part of my bad, because th- they show up, and you're already exhausted and you're and you're you know you're you're wiped out look you just took out a whole horde of of or a whole group of zombies by tricking them to fall off uh you know to act like lemmings off a bridge and now you got three what three dogs or was it four but i think it was four four dogs in front of you and rick I've never seen i've never seen dobermans with fangs before i, I guess they that 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 exists but i've never seen it before <laughs> Well, yeah, you're not going to, of course you're going to, the, the best thing to do is to shoot them all. So, oh, know, absolutely. Not I'm, not, oh, I'm not, I'm not questioning that. I'm just saying that the fact that she did it with such quickness and such, <clears throat> you know, um, uh, calculated coldness, you know, there was just no, there, there was just no hesitation because I think that, you know, there, her, Daryl and Maggie are going through this journey, right? And her journey is she's just angry. She's lashing out and she's, being stupid you know what i mean and 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 she just i think this was just another example i don't think it was necessarily stupid this example but it was just a demonstration of how quickly she was ready to pull the trigger well see i'm i'm just to back up a second her and noah i didn't take the first (coughs) her conversation with him has two parts to it there's the first part where he says i don't think i'm gonna make it and she's like well you're not Okay, and that's that was like her being cold, and that kind of hits him like a slap in the face, and it's almost like he realizes, like, well, oh, she crap, say, she says, yeah. then you won't, right? Then you won't, which is different, which means if you're gonna think that way, then you won't. No, exactly, no, exactly. Right. And then, okay. and he takes that kind of like a slap in the face, and he, like he, he, the right. look on his face is kind of like, oh crap, I, I guess I'm not gonna make it. But she softens, like she sees that, and then the look on her face kind of changes a little bit, and she softens, and that's when she says, just eat. So I didn't see it as so much that she's, you know, you know that's a, another, an extent of her, of her, you know, the cold, the new cold her as it's just, look, just eat, get your yeah, strength Yeah, but I, but up I disagree. Just, I'm, gonna, I'm totally going to disagree with you because the, the, part, the first part of what that just eat is don't think. Well, she well, didn't think on the bridge. Well, the right, others were thinking. Right, but she's saying don't think as in don't, you know, don't sit there and get bound up like are we going to make it or, you know, can I make it? Can I? Just don't do that. Go down to baser instincts and just eat and just survive. And it's, it's almost like go down to one step at a time. Take it one step at a time. And the first thing you got to do is eat, get your strength, and just move one step at a time. That's the yeah, way I I didn't it. see it that way. Uh, I think she's wearing Tyrese's military harness and belt. Okay. I'm not positive, but it looks like she's got the shoulder straps and the same belt set up that he had. And I, I, I have to go back and look, but I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if she is. I think that'd be cool if she is. Um, I thought it was cool. It, Glenn's efforts to try and get Maggie to drink Harkin brought me back to the, the efforts that Maggie made to get Abraham to drink. Remember when Abraham was completely shut down, she kept trying to get him to drink and, and she wouldn't. And now here's Glenn trying to do the same thing to her. I thought that was, you know, I love when they do that kind of stuff. Um, uh, you already brought up the fact that, you know, they address Maggie's lack of concern for Beth. I thought that was good. We needed that. Um, I thought the, one of the best lines of the whole episode was when Abraham offers booze to Sasha and she declines and says, it'll just make things worse. And he responds, the way you're going, the way you're going you're what's going to make things worse. <laughs> I thought that was excellent. And again, I, to me, that, that, that's uh, a comment directly to the fact that, hey, you're out of control. You're not thinking. You're not being logical. You're not working with us as a team. Mm-hmm. You're just this kind of rage-filled, striking out, not thinking person, and that's going to get us killed. I mean, and you know, he ended up with a sliced right. arm, which, by the way, if it went through a walker and then went through his arm, yeah. he's infected. Exactly. Well, I mean, everybody's infected, but he should have, that should have been – right. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, he got the then, he got he got he got the slice on him, and no, and it they saw it, and no one seemed yeah. to think anything. Yeah, about. yeah, I think they just they needed to to show that she was reckless, and they just said, you know, let's just do that. And but they what they should have done is had her completely miss the zombie. Mm. I mean, instead she hits the zombie, blood flies, and then she goes through him. You know, so that I think that was just a a, a mistake. And then of course he, he says, "Hey, you're with friends," and she says, "We're not friends." So <laughs> she's really cutting herself off. Um, uh, Daryl and, and the deer, um, which looked to me like it had starved to death. 
I don't, it looked, it didn't look like it had been torn apart. It looked like the backbone had come out. It had been setting. I don't know if it had been, maybe it had been shot and it dropped there. I couldn't but figure it, was, it out because it looked yeah. like something had been gnawn on its back because the, yeah, the, 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 the backbone the was all exposed. Yeah, was exposed. Yeah, definitely. Um, and then the, the guy on the tree who's the shot in the head, mm -hmm. you know, is that suicide? Is it not? But he just sits and he kind of stares at both mm -hmm. for a while. Now, last week, um, when Tyrese was, you know, it was clear that if you go back again and look, Tyrese is looking at all of these horrible things that we're seeing along the way. The, you know, the dead, the, the dead meat on the the ground, the bones of the person in the woods, and everyone else is walking by, and he's consciously looking at it. And I was making that point last week, you know, because. Um, and what, you know, he was being more affected by that and was tied into, was noticing this and it was, you know, and I think this Daryl seems to be obsessed the same way. He, he stops and looks at the, there's like a dead body on the side of the road at one point, mm -hmm. everybody else keeps marching by. It felt very much like what we saw with Tyrese, what they were doing with Tyrese last week, right. um, where he keeps noticing these things. And again, cause you know, for him, I think they're. You know, he's trying to decide if this is, you know, is this what it's all about? You right. know, is this what it's going to be? Um, uh, great line from Glenn to Daryl, you know, hey, we can make it together, but we can only make it together. Right. And, of course, that comes back in the end in the barn, you right. know, and I thought that was fantastic. Um, <laughs> Daryl's response, leaves to look for water. <laughs> yeah. He's just like, you know, boom. He does not want to talk to anybody. Of course, the cigarette burning scene I thought was cool. You know, um, I think that, uh, you, you know, that's a very, um, I think it's a very realistic um, mental reaction to this kind of pain and suffering and internalized problems that he's dealing with. You sure. know, that lots of times people do that. They, they externalize it by physically saying, you know, I got to feel something. Right. So I thought that was really, really cool. Um, love the water bottle scene, um, you know, with, Eugene jumps up, says, quality assurance, you know, he's like, I'm right. just going to drink it, fuck it, you know what I mean? Of course, he's our, you know, he kind of feels bad anyway, because he's like, let everybody to this mess because of the whole, so, you know, he's like, if I die, who cares, you know what well, I mean? The, well, that's the thing, is that every time he opens his mouth now, it's like when he was sitting there and his line about, I, I don't think, uh, I, what, what was it, it was something like, uh, I, I doubt that we've seen the last of, you know, or the last of the, or the, the worst is yet to come or something yeah, like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Think, I don't think things could get any worse is basically it, it, what he dude, says. Dude, shut up. Why are you <laughs> talking? And how does anybody listen to you? Like, and Rosita says, they can. <laughs> and then yeah. the dog, but then the dog showed up, I think, right? Yeah. Which turned out to be a good thing. Um, something I noticed, it, it, for some reason it stuck out in this episode for me. Uh, I, I also laughed my ass off when Abraham jumped up and slapped the water out of his hands. Yeah. And then there's the shot of his, and there's like the water is dripping off his face. <laughs> He's like just in total shock, you know. But also, what a what a 365, you know, 365. 365, uh, huh? Uh, yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> what a what a total reversal for Abraham. Here's a guy who was so mad at this guy that he almost killed him with his own bare hands. Right. And now he, you know, he won't let him drink the water for fear that it might be poisoned. Right. You know, so, you know, Abraham is completely turned, you know, around in terms of that and realizes everybody's important, even if you, you know, screwed up and did a stupid thing like he did. He's but, completely turned around 365 days. <laughs> <laughs> hey, don't take, don't, don't take advantage of me at 10 of 11 here. <laughs> uh, but the thing I notice is that the, the team Abraham, they, Team Abraham is still not right, really integrated into the group. No, and it's it it seems to me like it's almost a conscious thing by the writers, because if if you notice when their when one of their people has a se segment, the others from that group are who talk Tara, mm -hmm. um, uh, Rosita, or Abraham and Eugene. They all respond. You know? You know, when, when the issue came up about uh, Abraham drinking, it was Tara who said, that's not going to do any good. It was Rosita who said, I, you know, he knows that. Um, when Eugene steps up, it's Rosita that says, hey, stop that, Eugene, or whatever. And Tara's like, what are you, crazy? And then Abraham knocks the water out. And it's like, it's, it's, it's kind of weird because it's almost as if they're functioning as a team, a little mini team within the team. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Right, uh, and I don't know if that's a conscious thing that they're doing or what. But they have, you know, there was the small scene with Sasha and Abraham, um, but we didn't, you know, we don't really get many instances of any of that group, Abraham's group, with any of the main group one on one. 
Um, and even in the barn, there's none of them around the fire. Right, right. It's Carol, Michonne, Daryl, and Rick, yeah. and Carl sleeping. Um, uh, let's see. Um, yeah, I, I, again, the, they couldn't have been more literal when the rain comes and everyone is like really happy and smiling and joyous and Tara and Rosita lie down on the ground, they're laughing and everyone's happy. You get three shots, one of Daryl, one of Maggie, and one of Sasha, and they all look unattached yep. or yep. detached, unaffected, and miserable. Yeah. And, you know, I guess if you're looking to live, the rain is a blessing. And if you're looking to die, it's a curse. That's how I read that, you know. Um, so um, that was pretty cool. I thought, well done. And I think that's about where things start to change, you know, right right about, I'd say right about there. Um I'm going to talk about, you already talked about Gabriel. Um, well, I thought that it was interesting, the whole kids growing up conversation, you know, in this world. And then Michonne, you know, this isn't the world. And Glenn saying, you know, it might be. Right. <laughs> that was pretty funny. You know, but true that, that you know, it, it's really true about kids. You know, when, they, when you're raised in, with stuff, when you're raised in it, it's, it's the norm. Right. You know, and I noticed that as a parent with my own kids that, you know, I start getting all upset about stuff and, and, to, and I look at them and I'm thinking, you know, this to them is the normal. You know right, what I mean? Right. So, um, you know, it does. It makes them be able to function better in the now. Um, and, of course, we get the great line from the comic. Um, did you think that that was well done? Do you no. think this was the right time? No? No, I didn't like it at all. When I first oh. heard it, I... I, I was like, ooh, there it is. There's the title. And, and then I thought about it more, and I was like, oh, you totally, you, the writers, totally undid what you had, the, the coolness that you had in the beginning. The beginning of the, sh the, beginning of the show, the shot of, of the survivors walking ahead of the, the zombies behind, you said it all. You didn't have to say anything. I, I get it. You're the walking dead, right? Even as the show goes on, like you, see, it, like you hammered it home without ever using a word. And then to have Rick do it at the end, it just, it, it just felt like really heavy-handed. I was like, why? We, we don't need that. Like you don't, you don't need to have that. Yeah, I, it, it didn't have anywhere near the power that it had in the comic. No, I, I not totally at agree all. with you on that. The comic was set up differently because it takes place when they first find out that um, the disease is in everybody and mm -hmm. that no matter who you are when you die you're gonna you're gonna become so that was really the context for what he was saying um it just worked better you know and it felt but, it, and felt so it, for me it felt really out of place to drop that line here halfway through season five yeah you know? i i don't think it played a very important part in the series like it did in the comic but for this particular episode i think the reason they did it was because it gave an opportunity for Daryl to then turn around and say, no, we're not dead. We're not them. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And that was an important thing for him, you know, in terms of the story and his evolution in this particular story, the ability to say, hey, no, I'm not going, I'm not, you know, I'm not ready to, to say that. I'm not ready to quit yet, you know, which is quite a contrast from where he was in the very beginning of the episode. So well, I think like that's the, yeah, why that they like chose the to. Yeah, that was like the point that helped snap him out of right. his. That was that was the, you know, it was almost like the entire episode was just a layer upon layer upon layer, and then that was the breaking point, and then the Daryl that we know started to come yeah. back. I loved his his story about his grandfather and the war, um, and for the same reason that I loved the Tyrese story about his father and the news stories. That, you know, it was these little, you know, without giving us all a ton of monologue and everything else, it was just a little peek into this character's background that, you know, what made them the way they are today. And um, I love that because, again, it just it makes the characters richer for me. I also thought it was interesting to bring in a war, a war metaphor in this episode because I think it works on twofold. Obviously, the whole story about, you know, kind of having to... It, almost pretend like you're dead in order to get through every day um, because of the horrors and everything else. But also this story was kind of really an, an episode about three people suffering from a type of PTSD. Mm -hmm. And, and I think, you know, Daryl, Maggie and Sash, Sasha are all exemplifying 
you know, typical kind of PTSD symptoms from based on the, the horrors that they've been through and the losses that they've had. And I think that bringing that war metaphor in through that story without directly having to say something about it allowed there to be a little bit of a, of a, of a tip of the hat to that or, a, um, you know, a, a connection to that. And I think that was, that was pretty cool. Um, Okay, that's it for my goods. And then I've got bads. What about your bads? What were your bads? Because it sounds like you got a few. Um, I so I talked about one, which was uh, I didn't like the uh, I didn't like Rick's uh, Rick's speech. Um, the I I thought it was a little here. We've gone this entire most of the episode looking for water. Although they got to do something like I, I think Judith <laughs> yeah, is like part camel because. <laughs> If anybody is supposed to be like, it should be miserable. It should be her, and she was just fine. Um, I get that it's a child actor, and you know things you got little concessions right. you got to make, but um, it, it still was just a little weird. Uh, but the rain comes, and instead of going, instead of immediately going, oh my god, here's the rain! Like pull out everything and just start grabbing as much water as you can. We just have this, uh, you know, we have like a Coke commercial where the, with everybody standing in the, you know, laughing and right, having each other. And we got two right. girls who lay down on the ground. And yeah, that was, that was bad. And then, and then when Rick's like, all right, get all the stuff and start, and every, they lay out all their, all their, you know, their, their cups and, or their bottles and stuff. And then you just hear the wrath of God in the distance. And you look right. up and they just get the last bottle down practically. And Rick's like, all right. Let's get the hell out of here, you know? We got <laughs> I know. I know. That was pretty funny. Um, that was. The, uh, the barn scene. So I, I get the whole, I get the whole, when Daryl's at the door, he sees the, the zombies coming. There's not a call out for help, right? Uh, there, he's pushing against the door. I get that there's a storm going on, but who, who sees it first? Sasha. Sasha looks up. She sees that he's struggling. She doesn't say, oh my God, you know, come on, we got to go help him. She just gets up and silently runs to help him at the door. And I then think it's Maggie. I think Maggie's for, after Daryl, it's Maggie, then Sasha, I think. So it, it doesn't matter. It's still one right, at a right. time. Everybody's right. just like, and I, I, and I get the, the whole symbolism behind it. Like everybody's, right. you know, making that conscious choice to come along. And although I thought it was funny that, that Carl takes Judith and just kind of like laser, you know, down. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I just thought that was kind of, that was, that was a little, it was a little I ridiculous mean, just to be, just to hammer a point home. Yeah. I mean, it should have been like, uh, we've got problems and en masse, everybody should have jumped up and, and gone to it. Um, so right. I, that was, that uh, didn't quite work for me. Um, uh, I think those were the big ones. The, the, the dog thing was, uh, I didn't like the dogs just because they appeared and there was like this moment of tension, like, holy crap, it's the dogs. I mean, we even saw them on the, on the trailer for this week. And then yeah. it's, you know, four shots to the head or whatever. And, and that's over. So it was like, you know, a, a false promise of, of conflict. Um, yeah. So I, I wish it had been, you know, something a little bit, a little bit more, but um, yeah. So those were those were my big bads. Um, I was having trouble buying my bads, or mm -hmm. I was having trouble buying the whole zombie horde outside of the barn, coming out from nowhere. I mean, the, you're in this rainstorm. They're certainly not responding to the noise of people because they're in the barn being nice and quiet. Yeah. I mean, what's bringing them to to them? You know. Um, uh, so that that I and it was like a huge horde. So I, I, I had a little trouble with that. I also. Um, although I love the barn scene, I'm going to get to that in my ugly segment. Um, I, the, the cut from that imminent threat where they're all holding the wall, then boom, we're watching Maggie wake up, and they're and all was, and they're all laid so nicely around inside yeah, the yeah, barn and comfortable. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, granted, then we find out what happened, but still, it's like no one uh, was that, keeping, yeah, that was no a, one was there wasn't uh, you know. Three three people standing in watch, or you know, yeah. your your point about that horde coming up on the barn. We've seen for four or five, four and a half seasons now. We've seen that, yeah, just because they come to the front door, they kind of also spill around and manage to find a way to you know to probe and come in. So yeah, you held that door, but there's a door on the other side, or there's there's whatever. Right, so, yeah, right, exactly. I agree. Yeah. Um, 
Carl leaving Judith to hold the doors made me like wicked nervous. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and, and I don't, I don't think that that, you know, I mean, at that point, there's no, they don't need him. You know what I mean? Right. They had everybody there. They don't need him to do that. They need him to take care of that kid. That kid should, that, that infant should never not be in somebody's arms. Exactly. You know what I mean? So that, that was, that bothered me. Um, and then the only other bad I had was um, last week, Glenn was like all, F this, I don't care. It doesn't matter. No, you know what I mean? He's like, what's it matter? I don't care. I'm going to just kill that person now. I don't care. Right. You know, blah, blah, blah. I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. Now he's talking Maggie back from the edge. Right. And then telling her not to give up. I was like, I mean, I bought their interaction and I thought it was well done, but it just seemed out of context or inconsistent with what we saw of him last week. It was a big downshift know, last from last week. Yeah. 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 Exactly. So I had problems with that. All right, what's your uh, ugly? Well, my ugly is is, a, is actually a good ugly, and it's 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 despite the the whole mechanics of everybody coming to barricade the door, it's that whole final scene with the barn, and yeah. then the reveal afterwards, and just <laughs> the yeah. wrath of the wrath of God out there, and and yeah. you know all the zombies torn up. So. Yeah, I'm on board. Everything from the barn on, I just I freaking loved. Uh, you know, the barn marked for me the beginning of the return of of the three. The three zombies, Daryl, Maggie, and Sasha, to the three human zombies is what I'm calling them, you know, because they were really kind of so detached and falling away and, you know, really becoming almost like Walking Dead. And uh, the barn really marks the beginning. I mean, we have Maggie. Maggie comes in. She sees the Bible, um, finds the zombie woman who didn't choose to kill herself. And it was interesting. We had um, – who was it wrote in? Um yeah, Diane Maythorn wrote in, uh, whoa, Barn, Bible, and Lou, Maggie's stepmom, season two, Hala. I thought that was really interesting because I didn't put that together, but now it makes even more sense because it was all of a sudden there was this example for Maggie that was very much similar to her own life of, you know, a reason to keep fighting, that there's, you know, that, that, that she should choose to, to, to keep fighting and not give yeah. up. Um, and, and that was, that was a big dramatic point I thought for her character. Um, you know, of course then Carol says to her, you know, some people just can't give up like us. I'm trying kind of driving that home. Um, Daryl, you know, starts to have his moment coming out of the darkness. Um, first I think is just the knowledge of the barn. He doesn't share any of that with them, mm -hmm. but then when he gets back and there's this crisis, all of a sudden he, he, he finally, you know, now that he's burned his hand <laughs> he's had his cry right. you know and uh he's like i want to survive and i want these people to survive and boom you know he says the barn and, and they've got a place to hide so right starting with that you know he's kind of starting to come back um let's see uh just, just before that exchange um oh and then of course he has the, d the discussion with with rick which we talked about um and stands up to him about it which really kind of you know reaffirms that he's you know he's not ready to give up anymore um but just before that exchange with rick he's sitting there's a wonderful wonderful shot where he's sitting on the ground and he's bathed in this yellow warm light of the fire and behind him um is sasha who still is sitting in darkness by herself but there's a moonlight like or an exterior light that's coming in very light blue and shining on her and to me, it was, it was, again, it was, it was kind of this visual way of saying these characters, these three characters are starting to move out of the darkness and back into the light. And, um, I just, I thought that was really, really beautiful. Um, let's see. She also, Sasha's also at that point, I think they cut to another scene with her where she's watching Abraham polish off the booze. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of the way she's staring at him. She wasn't, you know, it wasn't a condescending or you're an ass for drinking it was more of kind of like uh, to me i read it as you know i, I was stupid to talk to him that way <laughs> that's that's how i read it um then daryl of course like we talked about he sees the, the zombies coming and immediately commits to surviving by you know trying to seal the door and hold it himself and i think i agree with you that that from a realistic point of view you would shout out and every you know try to get everybody immediately up and active and on there but from the story point of view we wanted to see the these three characters who are you know basically down and out rise up 
and work together and commit to surviving. And that's kind of what we got initially. And then the whole group gets in behind them. And I just thought that was, I thought it was a great, a really powerful moment. Um, and it, it brought me back to Glenn's comment of, you know, we can make it together, but only together. Right. Um, and then of course, Maggie wakes up, sees Judith, you know, which kind of, again, I think is immediate reaffirm, you know, that, that life is important and that she shouldn't give up. Um, and she realizes she needs to share that feeling, you know, um, with both Daryl and Sasha, as if she kind of realizes that the three of them are the ones that are having all of these issues. And, um, and then has that great scene with Daryl where he's fixed the music box, you know, which is, I think, you know, symbolic of, you know, her broken spirit being somewhat repaired. Um, they also finally talk about Beth and Tyrese, but I love that they don't use their names. Mm-hmm. She, you know, he says to her, he was tough when he's looking at Sasha and, and she says he was. And then, then he says, so was she. Um, she didn't know it, but she was. Yeah. And that was great. You know, they were just, it was just really, really touching, I thought. Um, and of course, her taking her outside after the aftermath of the storm, which, you know, I think was, uh, I understand people's like, oh my God, there was so much mass destruction and everything else. But it, again, it was, it was a story and it's a metaphor for the, all of the fury that's been going on inside the, the three of them, you know? And, and I, that's how I saw it. And, and, um, you know, and, it sh- and sh- I think she, yes, yeah, she does. She says, um, I think Sasha says, look at this. It should have torn us apart. And then I think Maggie says it didn't, you know, and again, I think that's not talking, you know, about the storm on one level, but about their emotional right. pain and struggle through the episode. Um, and then of course, why are we here at the sunrise, you know, for this and obviously, you know, to, to see the new day. Um, the, for me, the best was that final shot when Aaron comes in, introduces himself, and you get this, like, you know, he even says, stranger danger. Yeah. That, was, that was hilarious, right? But the girls have the guns trained on him, and the music box starts. Yeah. And they both quick turn and look at the music box in total amazement, and the camera holds there for a second as the music box, you know, plays, and then they both turn and look at Aaron, their guns pointed at him. And for me, it was like the ultimate visual that they had both regained their inner music, their spirit for life and their desire to survive. And that this dude had better not dick with them because they will take him out in a heartbeat to keep their music playing. That's, you know, that's, that's what I saw. You know, maybe I'm getting too, uh, we had a right, we had somebody write in and say that we were like frustrated uh, lit uh, English lit teachers or something. Yeah. English lit majors. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, it was just it's it was just a cool just such a such a cool shot the two of them they're almost in silhouette they've got their guns pointed and they look at the music playing and then they look back at him and there's just determination like we got our mojo back baby and you are not messing with us you know what i mean i thought that was really cool it was really good so i i i, I overall really loved the episode all right what was your <laughs> uh what was your zombie kill of the week oh jeez um I didn't have one. There, there really wasn't too many good, you know, zombie kills or anything unique. I, I, I liked the bridge uh, scene. I thought that that was creative, uh, you know, and, and an ingenious way to to handle getting that horde off their back. Although, you know, when you think about it, all they would end up doing is crawling out of there and continuing on the journey. But it would give them some room to space between them, you know. But um, how about you? Did you have a, a zombie kill? Oh yeah, mine is the one in the shot when they show all the the zombies that are have trees falling on them, whatever. And, and, <laughs> yeah, and there's that yeah. one that's about fifty feet up, gourd <laughs> on the tree. That I was awesome. I didn't see that. I saw the gourd one on the ground. I didn't see the gourd one oh, up yeah, in the there's, tree. There's one that's, that's funny hanging up there. That was that was that was sweet. <laughs> you had to go back. And, someone someone needs to pull a screenshot off on that one. That one that was great. Um, all right. So what about your character of the week? Oh, it has to be the three amigos, you know. I think they, they all three of them did a great job, and um, it, it was a huge task. For also, the writers too, obviously, but it was a huge task to try and do so much with those three characters in one episode. I mean, you know, to see yeah. all of that range of of emotion and all that character development in one episode for three different characters. That was a that was tough, and plus you had the whole rest of the cast. That's got to be hard to shoot that, you know what I mean? Um, I was uh, so you know I, I from the story wise, definitely the three of them. 
Yeah, I, I, I kind of give the edge to Daryl. I just found him uh, more conflicted and just more interesting than, than the other two. But, um, yeah, definitely all three of them were, were front and center. On the, if I had on to pick episode. one, I'd probably do Maggie. But I think that's only because I think they gave Maggie more. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, she had the scene with the, you know, with the, the zombie in the trunk. She had the opening sequence with the tears and the zombie coming and that she had to kill. Um, she had the conversation with Carol. She, I mean, Daryl had, had quite a bit too. And, but, um, you know, I think they gave Maggie more, but, but if I had to, I'd, I would give it to her. All right. You got uh, some things you want to read? Uh, yeah, we've got some notes here from, um, Am I, am I doing Abby's? No. What am I doing? Oh, I can do Abby's real oh, quick. Yeah, you're going to do Abby's and Gary's, and I'm going to do Laura's, right? So Abby uh, wrote in again. He said he gives it a super solid 4.5 noggin shots. <laughs> I like noggin shots, by the way. I think we call it headshot. I'm gonna, I think we should go to we're, noggin we're, shots. We might have to take that. Uh, <laughs> we're going to steal that, Abby. Abby, we're going to steal it from you. We give you uh, credit. We give you credit. Uh, he says, great episode, I must say. This was something I wanted for a long time. I love when they do scavenge episodes. This was needed way back before they took the prison in season three. This episode had a lot of different interactions between the group, and it was interesting. Uh, Biter in the Trunk was a great scene. Loved it. Um, his good was the, basically the entire episode. Uh, the bad, so Daryl just walks off whenever he chooses. Um, <laughs> ugly, his good, it was a good ugly for him, was the music box ending. Uh, and then he says, I really had no real... No real reason to complain about this episode, which is usually not the case. The group feels uh, stronger now to me. A lot of bonds were made. I think I might watch this episode again. It was that good. Um, it's like a feel-good episode. Nobody died. People cried, and lots of bladed knives. Um, <laughs> all right. Excellent. And Abby always ends with, bites kill you. <laughs> That's a good one, too, Abby. All right. So you got uh, Gary. I got Gary, or you, I think uh, I was going to do Laura. You oh, got, okay, I got Gary. You got Gary. So Gary uh, wrote in and he said, uh, what's happening and what's going on? That probably should have been the title of this week's episode. <laughs> other, than being a, funny. other than being a thirsty, hungry, and depressed group, not much was going on. A few things stood out for me. Is it possible that Abraham was infected from Sasha's knife during the Walker massacre at the bridge? Yeah, that's mm. what we, we talked about that. I yeah. did notice the scalp come off the walker that was trying to bite Rick when Daryl pulled him away by grabbing his head, which I thought was really cool. Yeah. Um, Dr. Carroll needs to have more counseling sessions with Daryl as he's now using his hand to put out lit cigarettes. <laughs> and a- after what Eugene did, why did Abraham stop him from drinking the water that was left on the road for the group? The group retreated to a barn during a torrential downpour where Rick gave his We Are the Walking Dead speech. Um, he talked, uh, Gary says the group was really slow in responding to the horde of walkers trying to push the doors open. Uh, they were quickly aided by a tornado that destroyed everything outside the barn. Um, <laughs> Sasha and Maggie's morning sunrise was interrupted by a very clean cut and healthy looking guy identifying himself as Aaron who, Oh yeah. You know, Aaron asking Rick by name was, uh, was interesting. At first when I saw the, when they saw the note, you know, from a friend, I thought it was Morgan. I wrote down the, in my notes, I was like, that's gotta be Morgan. Uh. (laughs) Um, But uh, Gary gives it, gives the episode three headshots as well. Thanks, Gary, for writing in. Um, I've got uh, two notes from Laura. Uh, Laura said, Jeff and Kirk, welcome back, guys. Wish I'd had time to write in on the last episode, but was too busy all week um, to lay my thoughts to email. So I figured I'd write immediately after the show this week. I, too, loved last week's episode. It was lyrical, yet still creepy and more tense and eerie. Uh, Boy, so is this, this is last week's. We should have read this at the beginning. Oh, well, okay. Uh, sorry about that, Laura. Uh, so this is these are her thoughts on last week's. Um, I thought the more intense and eerie with the erratic camera work, crackling radio transmissions, and dissonant musical score than an episode full of Walker guts flying. Though I never really connected with Tyrese's character, the discussion he had with Noah about his father disregarding, describing the high cost of living was more character development on Tyrese's character than I've seen in the past two seasons. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. One interesting point I'll make is that you guys were discussing... A few cast back, the significance of the imagery with the actors' names in the opening credits. Well, now we know the significance of Emily Kinney's and Chad Coleman's, as they are both on the same frame over the scene of a darkened hallway or alley, symbolic of their back-to-back character deaths. Uh, hmm, that, I hadn't I noticed thought, that. Yeah, I thought that was interesting when I read that. Yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't seen that. That's cool. 
Uh, I also enjoyed this week's episode. I knew this week's was in here somewhere. <laughs> Despite the slow pace, uh, I liked seeing Sasha, Maggie, and Daryl dealing with their loss and guilt in different ways. I also liked the moments of divine intervention, the rain and the downed trees stopping the walkers. Just as Father Gabriel seems to be losing his religion, I'm humming R.E.M. in my head right now. <laughs> Even the scene of the dead frogs in the dried up creek made me think of the plague of frogs from the Old Testament. But one question... Those frogs still looked fresh and juicy. Why didn't the gang just roast up some frog legs to accompany their canine kebabs? Totally. Absolutely. I've had fr uh, frog before, actually. It's pretty good. Tastes just like chicken. Um, all right. Uh, guys, I know this might be too late, but I have a P.S. to my feedback. I've seen a lot of comments on the interwebs about how people thought this episode was boring and the part about the storm and the trees knocking out the walkers, but not the barn was too unbelievable. Here's my response to that. On second watching, I really loved this episode, even more than last week. In fact, it's one of my favorites of the season so far. I loved that it was a moment to experience the grief and despair of, of the group, uh, despair of where the group is and have a more cerebral episode of character development. I would agree with that. Plus, I loved the unity of the group as they all literally and symbolically tried to hold back the tide of horrors, trying to get them through the barn doors. Beautiful, amazing writing, filmmaking, and acting. Yeah. Um, then she uh, talks, secondly, for a long time, we had a huge dead cottonwood tree in our backyard, and we continued to say we, we would cut it down when we got the resource as well. Mother Nature took care of it for us one stormy night. On all sides of this tree were homes, property, and power lines that it could have hit and caused major destruction thanks to our good fortune or maybe divine intervention. The tree fell on one 12-foot narrow path in our backyard where it would do no damage. Plus, the trunk split just high enough up that when the tree fell, it barely scraped the back of our house. Tornadoes are crazy things. They can touch down and obliterate one house while the house next door gets nary a scratch. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's true, you know. Um, it, it, didn't, uh, it didn't bother me that the barn didn't get destroyed or that they didn't get blown away. I just think that um, the fact that the the storm literally blew all those zombies away from the door was a little hard, a little hard to take. I guess as trees swung by and hit them or whatever, um, or if that was happening slowly, like they were getting peeled off, but just to, to have them holding this huge mass of horde and then cut and Maggie's waking up, um, I had trouble with that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but, you know, not to beat a dead horse <laughs> or a dead zombie. <laughs> all right. All right, that's it. That's uh, we had a few other couple things, but we have run out of time. Yeah. So um, if, you, uh, if you think we missed anything, I think Kirk pretty much went uh, minute by minute on the entire episode. <laughs> so uh, if you think we... <laughs> If you think you missed anything, uh, you know, make sure you uh, write in. Jeff's and let us know. dozing off in the middle there. He just <laughs> popped up here at the end to say goodbye. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm uh, gonna. I told you. I told before we started recording. I said I'm gonna have to start stop rewatching this. I, for this, for some reason, this season I've tried to rewatch, um, and I never used to do that. And I think as a result, uh, you know, I see a million other things that I want to mention. So. I'll, I'll try and get it in check, guys. Sorry when, about that. When we first started, when we first started doing the podcast, I remember Kirk would show up and he'd have like a a, a, a piece of paper with with That's notes right. written on it. Now he comes in, he's got a he's got a full like legal pad. Everyone has a this, brand new legal pad. I think this thing is like ten or eleven pages. This printout, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Um, listen, if you want to uh, you want to comment on this or rag on the fact that I'm I'm dragging on and talking too much. Uh, <laughs> You can write us at, uh, at, at, at biterspodcast at gmail.com. Um, you can post up on our Facebook page as well. Um, how else can people talk to us? Twitter. Twitter, at baby. At Biters Podcast. At Biters Podcast. Uh, I'm also at Batman KM, and Jeff is at J Marzak. J Marzak. J Marzak. And uh, I think that's all we got for this week. So uh, we will see. Yeah, we'll look talk for, to everybody next week. Yeah, and look for my latest tribute art. Um, thank you for everybody who posted up uh, comments about the, the most recent one with Tyrese. 
Uh, appreciate that. Really, uh, really appreciate all the support for my work. And um, Chad I, Coleman put put it up on his yeah. Uh, Instagram, he posted it up it? on his Instagram account. He used it. He had a Reddit uh, um, interview thing going on, and he po- he used that as like the advertisement for oh, it. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, yeah, it was cool. He he gave me credit for it, and uh, you know it was nice. It was it got me a lot of attention, so I appreciate that. So I've I've got plans for this one. I haven't started it yet, but uh, I will tomorrow, and uh, hopefully before Saturday or by Saturday we'll have the new one up. All right. Sounds good. All right, everybody. Thanks so much for listening and tuning in. We will catch you next week. All right. Take care, everybody. Peace.